Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Brian Green. It's good to see you again. I represent the Maryland, D.C., Virginia Solar Energy Industries Association, or MDVCA. Uh, our basic mission is to protect and grow the regional solar market by advocating for pro-solar pro policies. MDVCA has more than 140 members in the region, equating to over 5,000 jobs. These members work in all areas of the solar industry, including designing, financing, manufacturing, installing, selling, and maintaining solar energy equipment, as well as others whose work supports solar industries. This case and this proposal presents quite a challenge for MDVC. On the one hand, MDVC's mission, as I said, is to grow the solar market. Uh, as a result, MDVC is very pleased that Dominion has proposed a new 20 megawatt facility for all of the pro-solar reasons that Dominion has explained in its application and in its testimony. MDVC does not want the Commission to reject this project uh, or for Dominion to be in any way discouraged from engaging in further solar development in the Commonwealth. On the other hand, MDVC has serious concerns about the process used by Dominion to explore third-party alternatives in the selection process for this project. We also have concerns about the process going forward to develop additional solar initiatives to take full advantage of the current 30% federal tax credit that will be reduced at the end of 2016. First, with respect to third-party alternatives, to MDVC's knowledge, this is the first CPC application involving new generation that will be decided under the new statutory standard that the General Assembly adopted in 2013. Uh, specifically, the 2013 General Assembly added the following legal requirement for CPC and proceedings. In the statute says, quote, a utility seeking approval to construct a generating facility shall demonstrate that it has considered and weighed options, including third-party market alternatives in its selection process. In the Brunswick case that Mr. Reed alluded to, in a final order entered on August 2nd, 2013, uh, that case, by the way, did not involve application of this new criteria. Uh, the Commission held, though, that the new law, quote, clearly will affect CPCN proceedings in the future. This is a new statutory standard that an applicant will have to satisfy. That is, under this new statute, a CPCN applicant no longer has the option of trying to prove its case without evidence of consideration of actual third-party alternatives in its selection process. End quote. In this case, the evidence will show that Dominion has not conducted a competitive bid to ascertain the true cost of, quote, actual third-party alternatives. Instead, Dominion compares its Remington project to PPAs entered into in North Carolina in 2014 uh, to an 80-megawatt solar facility that it had scaled down to 20 megawatts for a cost comparison purpose and also to an existing 18-megawatt landfill gas facility. Therefore, one question before the Commission, and the Commission will be called upon to determine, is whether Dominion's comparison to these other existing facilities, without more, adheres to the new statutory standard. Second, MDVC is concerned about solar development, specifically through the end of 2016. MDVC encourages the Commission to adopt policies and take action in this case that will take full advantage of the tax credit and the evolving solar market that has seen reduced costs. MDVC is confident that the market would respond favorably to a future RFP for additional solar megawatts as it would have had one been issued for the proposed Remington project. And so with that in mind, MDVC recommends that the Commission approve the project today uh, and in addition, or as a condition to approval, require Dominion to issue a solar RFP for a minimum of 20 megawatts, but not to exceed 200 megawatts, to be in service by the end of 2016. 
we think such a result would be reasonable and certainly in the public interest under the statutes and with the tax credit uh, being what it is. And with that, we look forward to participating in a hearing today. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Again, my name is Kale Jaffe uh, with the Southern Environmental Law Center representing Appalachian Voices and Chesapeake Climate Action Network. Uh, environmental respondents here have four points that we hope to uh, bring out during the course of the proceedings. The first of those points is that the construction of the Remington Solar Facility uh, is in the public interest according to Virginia law, just as a simple matter by statute. Uh, as the company is alluded to, uh, Section 56-580D says that small renewable energy projects like this are in the public interest. And in addition, the recently amended 56-585.1A6, which went into effect July 1 of this year, uh, and as the company acknowledged, uh, also states that the construction or purchase by a utility of up to 500 megawatts of solar in Virginia is also in the public interest. Uh, and the declaration in particular of up to 500 megawatts of Virginia-made solar as being in the public interest, we think is especially important in this case. It's in the same uh, paragraph, the same section of the code that discusses the third-party market alternatives, and it's our view influences how you apply that here when, uh, the, case, when the project is by statute in the public interest has to be read uh, in context with that, that, that whole paragraph um, that discusses third-party market alternatives as well. The second major point, so that's the first point on, on it being in the public interest. The second major point that we hope to uh, bring out relates to anticipated cost of energy from the Remington facility. We note that uh, Mr. Francis Hotzel, the witness who's filed pre-filed testimony on behalf of the Solar Energy Industries Association, uh, has identified a range of energy prices uh, that s recent solar projects have um, been purchased for in the PPA market, the Power Purchase Agreement market. And he notes prices in a range of between $50 to $75 per megawatt hour. Uh, we think that the evidence in this case, in particular there's a, an interrogatory response that we hope to bring into the record that will uh, explain this, but the evidence in this case will show that the average uh, cost of energy over the 35-year life of the Remington project fits within that ballpark that Mr. Hotzel has identified. The third point that we hope to uh, elucidate here is the importance um, of projects like this. The significant development of solar projects like Remington are an essential part, an essential part of a lowest cost strategy to reduce carbon emissions as early as possible. Uh, the pre-filed testimony from the, the company and the commission staff uh, has discussed the benefits of building solar as soon as possible, early in the process, uh, as a means of preparing for the clean power plan. Uh, the company has also filed testimony recognizing uh, the value that photovoltaic solar installations provide, particularly in, uh, to customers during peak summertime hours. Uh, the companies also discuss solar as a proven and reliable technology. And both the company and the staff have recognized the value of the 30% federal investment tax credit uh, for projects uh, that are placed in service by the end of 2016. And I think the way to think of that 30% investment tax credit, our view is solar is a very good deal uh, for ratepayers, regardless of the tax credit, whether it's at 10%, 30%, or goes away entirely. But with a 30% in place right now, it's the equivalent of a, of a tent sale, and it's a good time to jump on as much of it as you can. So those are our first three core points relating to the positive benefits of the Remington project in particular. Uh, the fourth and final point that the environmental respondents hope to bring out uh, is a concern that we have that the company is not developing solar projects as quickly as is, is needed to, one, prepare for the Clean Power Plan, and two, to take advantage of that 30% federal ITC. As a result, environmental respondents are recommending today that the commission conditionally approve the Remington facility on the company implementing the aggregated RFP model that uh, Mr. Hotzel for the Solar Energy Industry Association has outlined to develop 
uh, at least an additional 20 megawatts of solar to be placed in service before the end of 2016. In other words, yes, build the Remington project and also concurrently purchase at least an additional 20 megawatts through an RFP process. And in fact, we think there are two precedents that we'd like to highlight today that support that kind of conditional approach. Uh, the first is from Georgia in July of 2013, the Georgia Public Service Commission ordered Georgia Power to procure an additional 525 megawatts of new solar generation by 2016. And in that same case, required Georgia Power to use an RFP process to identify the best cost solar resources. That was uh, Georgia Public Service Commission docket numbers 36498 and 36499. Here in Virginia, we also have a recent precedent that we think is helpful. Uh, on the petition of Appalachian Power Company to implement a portfolio of energy efficiency programs, the commission in a recent final order this summer conditioned approval of APCO's programs on the company accepting a series of modifications. And that's the kind of approach we're, we're advocating for here. That was in PUE 2014. 0039. In sum, as Virginia and this commission prepare for implementation of the Federal Clean Power Plan, it is important, it is vital to take early action to expand opportunities for solar resources. Solar is a low cost compliance option and will represent a very good deal for ratepayers for many years in the future. But with a 30% federal <coughs> investment tax credit set to go down to 10% by the end of 2016, now is an especially good time for solar, and an especially good time to open up Virginia markets for solar development. Thank you. Thank you.